So what did you think when you got the final exam and the solution on Monday night? <laughs> I was actually on a, in a, you, this is why you should never email while you're in transit. I was in a car to Hanover, New Hampshire because I had to give a talk in Dartmouth. So I'm in this car ride from New Haven. And I said, I'll get some work done. <laughs> Famous last words. So I sent it out and my first reaction was, it is what it is, so I, there's nothing I could do. So I, I did write a new exam on my way back last night. So we're, we're all done. And this time, I'm not emailing it to you guys till after the exam. So you know, so this is one more exam. It's, it's not a big deal. So it's not as if anybody died. There was no blood in the ground. No, all's good. No. But you have lots of exams to practice on now, plus one, right? So. Um, Couple of things, uh, getting you ready for what's coming. One is uh, obviously the project is due Monday, and you're going to hear from me multiple times every day. And uh, this morning I sent, I know you've stopped reading my emails, but this is the time to start reading my emails. If you've been avoiding them, ignoring them, you know, maybe you've set up a smart mailbox, just trash them as they come in. No, untrash them because there is going to be information you will need. And one of the things I sent out this morning was a summary spreadsheet. Right? It's not, so this is not some added work for you. Actually, it is, but it's like two minutes at the end. It's as you get all the numbers for your project lined up, things like your Jensen's alpha, your beta, your optimal debt ratio, everything that you have to do in your project, the summary spreadsheet just asks in one line what those numbers look like for your company. And I, you know, and I'll tell you why the, the two reasons I asked for that. One is it kind of ma you ma can make sure then that you're hitting all the numbers you need because if you sign, find a missing one, so what the heck is he asking for? You probably need to go back and read that section. I don't think that's going to happen. The second is today we're actually going to finish packet three, packet two. You said packet three, packet two. Um, and you say, what are we going to do Monday? Monday we're going to have some fun. We're going to look at what you found on corporate governance, on you know, your beta regression on capital structure, on uh, how, what percentage of the companies came in as under leavened. Remember, I, very first class, one of the things I said, I hope you get out of this class, is perspective. Perspective in what sense? If I tell you your company does not pay dividends, and if you're not in finance, you say, well, is that uncommon? Because that sounds unusual, company that doesn't pay dividends. We're going to say what percentage of the 300 companies in this class pay no dividends. What the typical debt ratios across the 300 companies? No. So you're going to get some sense, and I'm going to do that with your numbers. So I need the numbers. So that spreadsheet, if you can get it to me by 
Sunday at, I'm trying to think of how late I can do this without getting into serious trouble because I've got to get the numbers, I've got to put them into a spreadsheet, I've got to run summary statistics, I've got to convert them into graphs, put them in slides and make copies the next morning. So midnight at Sunday, so basically I think I can pull off Monday morning would be a kind of a hectic morning. But if you can get it by midnight Sunday, that would be good. I'd prefer to get them as groups simply because the logistics of, because every time I get one, I copy and put it into a, don't mess with the spreadsheet. Don't add columns, don't take away columns, because then I can't cut and paste. It just throws me all off. So, so don't, don't, the spreadsheet is not for you to convey your project's other concerns to me. It's just give me the number or don't give me the number. And here's the thing, I would rather have it in a group, but if you cannot all, you know there's that one person, you, you know the person I'm talking about, who's way behind. If you have five out of six people done in the group, send, send me the five, don't look at anybody now because you're giving away clues, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's send me the data on the five people in your group who have the numbers rather than wait for the sixth person because I'd rather have five out of six and none out of six, okay. So obviously I'm not grading you based on the submission, but if you don't send it in, I can't include it in my final summary. So that's one. The second is um, your final exam you know, is, is next Friday, 10 to 12. I will send you the seating arrangements, and there is that early option on May 14th, which I don't think many of you are taking, which is good because you get more time to study. But if, you know, because if you're graduating, sometimes you want to get this out of the way because you have other stuff coming. So if you want to take that option, make sure you go and sign in that Google Shared Spreadsheet. I need to know how many people are taking the exam that day. And it's not the same exam. So don't try to you know, kidnap one of these people, you torture them. You know, that, none of that is going to, it's a different exam. Can I guarantee they're going to be both equally? I have no idea. I just write different exams. I have no idea when I write them whether they're going to be difficult or easy. They're just different. Okay? So May 14th, if you want to do it, sign in on the Google Shared Spreadsheet. And on the final project itself, please try to stay within the page limit. Somebody remind me what the page limit is? It's 20 pages if you have five companies and two extra pages for it. And don't cheat by making your font really small and fitting into, I, you know, I can't, my eyes are not that good anyway. So if I can't read it, I'll act like there's nothing on a page and move on and say that was a blank report. So don't shrink to fit, don't do stuff to get, and I'm completely open on formatting. If you look at the old reports, some are Word, some are PowerPoint. None are Excel. So don't turn in five Excel spreadsheets to me because I'm not going through five Excel spreadsheets. No, less is more, right? So if you can do it in 10 pages, amazing, okay? Because this is not, don't describe to me things I think I know, you know, like, <laughs> No, this is how I got the bottom up beta, and you go through the process of this is a bottom. I, know, I, I think we both understand what that is. I'd like you to tell me more about what your cost of capital means and how you got there. More about why your company got its optimal debt ratio to be 60% rather than how you got the optimal. Right? So think about this as, a, as, as essentially a narrative about your company built around numbers. Because by now you're forming at least a judgment about what your company does as a business, how it, what it does well, what it does badly, and that's what the project is supposed to convey. And the f I, I did put up the review session for the final exam, and I used the spring 2017 exam as the illustrative. I should have used just the exam I sent to you day before yesterday. That would have been easier. You know? But essentially it goes through the, and you can see the structure of the exam is basically the whole class. You know, the couple of prompts from betas and cost of capital, a couple of prompts from capital, uh, from investment, in, uh, from capital budgeting, a couple of prompts from capital structure, and you end with dividend policy and valuation. Are there any logistical questions? Okay. So if you want to change companies, can you do so? I have no problem with you doing so, as long as you get done by Monday. That's my only constraint. So if you are, you know, wrestling with a company, and, and actually when you do a second company from scratch, you're gonna be amazed at how much quicker it goes. And that's one of the things I hope you're able to take out of this is the capacity to redo this on any company of your choice. So there are no questions, I want to close up the valuation discussion. 
And one of the other, the, the, the spreadsheet I sent you kind of does what, what I'm, I'm doing in the session. So let's talk about what we've already got nailed down. You first need cash flows, right? Those cash flows can either be cash flows to the firm or cash flows to equity. Cash flows to equity, you can define narrowly as dividends, which sometimes you do because you're desperate. You can't get net capex. You can't get change in working capital. That was what I did at Deutsche in 2007. I said, I don't know what the cash flows are, so I'm going to use dividends. But then again, in 2016, when I revisited Deutsche, I said, you know what? Even for Deutsche, I'm going to try to get cash flows to equity because trusting the company to pay out dividends or it's losing money doesn't make any sense. But if you have a company where you can estimate net capex and change in working capital and debt payments, we looked at free cash flows equity as the cash flows left over after debt payments. The alternative is to compute cash flows to the firm, pre-debt cash flows. Pre-debt cash flows are before interest expenses and before debt payments. So that's the first stop. And which one you choose to use will depend on what you think about leverage in the future, whether you think debt ratio are going to change. And if you think debt ratios are, ch are going to change or you're uncertain about them, better to do a firm valuation. Second stop was discount rates. And here we discovered that we've already done the dirty work, right? Cost of equity, cost of capital. Exactly the same definition in valuation as in corporate finance. There we used it as a hurdle rate. Now we're using it to value the entire b business. So if you have cash flows to the firm, the discount rate is cost of capital. Cash flows to equity is cost of equity. Then we talked about growth, and I said, you should be uncomfortable when you estimate growth. Why? Because you're trying to forecast the future, and we know things can happen that will throw you off. But you've got to make your best estimates given what you know today. You can never be asked to do more than that. All you can do is make your best estimates given what you know today. And that growth rate has to come from what the company does. The two parameters that drive your growth is how much is my company reinvesting and the other is how well is it reinvesting. And how you capture those two numbers will depend on, again, whether you're equity focused or firm focused. If you're equity focused, you measure how much you reinvest with the retention ratio, the portion of your net income you put back into the business. If you're firm focused, you look at the percentage of your after-tax operating income that you put back, the reinvestment rate. You look at how good your projects are. But with, with, as an equity investor, you think about return on equity, net income divided by book equity. Whereas when you look at the entire firm, you look at return on invested capital. After-tax after operating income divided by book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. Let me emphasize again, this is the only place in finance we use book values. There should be no other part of the project where book value even comes in. Right? Everywhere else, it's market value. When we do debt to equity for levered betas, cost of capital, everywhere else is market value. But with accounting returns, we go back to book value. I know it's late in the class to be asking this question, but I want to make sure everybody can, because I get asked this question at least a half a dozen times every week on why, if we use market values everywhere else, do we use book values when we do return equity and return invested capital? Anybody want to try that? Because you're going to be asked this question. Okay. Why do we use book values? Now, after all, we said we don't trust accountants. Accountants are horrible people. No, we didn't say that. But basically, the numbers, they turn out. The, and then we use book values. So why do we use book values rather than market values? Yes? Well, but well, can't I use the same argument for, for cost of capital? Why shouldn't I use historical numbers? Why do I switch to forward-looking, updated numbers there? So it's true that it's historical, but it's always been historical. And everywhere else, we decided it, precisely because it was backward looking, we did not want to use it. Yes, Louisa. Yeah. What are you trying to measure with return equity or return invested capital? How good are my existing investments? Right? Let's take an example. Let's assume you invested $100 in a project two years ago. And it's an incredibly good project. It's making a $50 profit every year, right? That's about 50% returns. Did you take a good project? Let's start with the U.S. Assuming it's in U.S. dollars, not Venezuela and Bolivar. 50% is a good return, so it's obviously a good project. Let's say I mark that project up to market. What does that mean? I look to see what somebody would pay me for that project today. What's going to happen? The $100 is going to become $500. And when I divide the income by the market value, what am I going to find? If I mark to market correctly, what should I earn on every project? I should earn roughly my cost of equity capital. That's the definition of marking to market. 
You see what's going to happen if I mark everything up to market and compute a return on market value. If I do it right, I, I should find good companies, bad companies, average companies all earn their cost of capital. It's removing any capacity I have for rewarding good companies and punishing bad companies. So we use book value because it's what you have invested in projects and we're hoping and praying that accountants haven't screwed up that number. In what way? What does fair value accounting try to do? It gets in our way, right? Because it takes $100 and tries to mark it up. Or if you make a bad mistake, it tries to write it off. And if they have their way, we will lose our capacity to compute return on equity and return on capital at companies. And that will be a bad thing, because we will not be able to differentiate between good and bad companies as well. If accounting has its way and book value starts to become some proxy for market value. So cash flows, discount rates, growth rates. Let's put closure here. What do we say a value of an asset is? The present value of its expected cash flows over its lifetime, right? So if I have a 10-year project, I take cash flows for the next 10 years, I discount them for 10 years. At the end of the 10th year, I might have some salvage value if there's any, and I discount it back, and I'm done. But when you value a publicly traded company, the problem you run into is at least in theory, your company can last forever. Why at least in theory? Because we know companies do, there is a point in time where companies go, Sears, 120 years into its existence has gone away. But at least in theory, your company can last forever. And we can't estimate cash flows forever. Our spreadsheets, I think, what's the limit in Excel? I've never tested the limit. How many columns can you have? Like 16,000 something? Yeah. If you decide to go to that end column, good luck to you. But well before you get there, you get tired. So you need closure, some way of stopping your cash flows and saying, I'm done, but not ignoring what happens after that. And the way we get closure in, in discounted cash flow valuation is by making an assumption. The assumption is not going to make you happy. The assumption we make is, at some point in time in the future, my cash flows will start to grow at a constant rate forever. And you know what that gets you, right? In the infinite series, and you get this way of putting closure on it with a present value equation. That equation is not a finance equation. It's a math equation for an infinite series, which we've essentially used in finance. So essentially, you get to year 10. You tell me your cash flows will grow at x percent a year forever. I basically can take the cash flows in year 11. You always need to go that extra year in your numerator and divide by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate. And this is perhaps the most dangerous equation in valuation. You see why? Take a look at that equation. If I keep the cash flows as they are, and I have a discount rate, and I start to play with G, and I'm going to use the word play intentionally. So I take a G of 2% and I make it 2.5%, 3, 3 and a half. What's happening as I move my growth rate? Your, your value keeps going up. This is the, if you get a low value for your company and you want to make it a higher value, this is one of the classic tricks, right? Let's play with G. Three and a half, four, four and a half, five. And it, before you know it, you have what I call Buzz Lightyear valuations. As G hits R, your valuations go to infinity and then you go beyond, right? And I've actually seen discounted cash flow valuations. The growth rate is set at 20% a year forever. And somebody emails me and says, what's wrong with this equation? It's giving me a negative value for Google. There's nothing wrong with the equation. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> You're taking an equation meant for a growth rate forever and putting in a 20% growth rate forever. And what do you think is going to happen to Google at a 20% growth rate forever? It's not. There are some assumptions in valuation where you and I can agree to disagree. So if you think Levi Strauss is going to grow at 12%, I think it's going to grow at 6%, I can't prove you're wrong and you can't prove I'm wrong. We have different assumptions. But this is one of those assumptions where you cannot violate mathematical bounds. So we're going to put a limit on the growth rate. That growth rate cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy in which you operate. In real terms and nominal terms, it depends on how you've done the rest of your evaluation. You can't suddenly wake up in year 10 and say, what, cash, what are my cash flows? If you've done things in real terms, which means you've not bought inflation in, your growth rate has to be capped at a real growth rate, which globally is probably going to be 1.5%, maybe 2% in terms of real growth. If you've done your valuation in nominal terms, which most of you have, right, whether it's in dollars or euros or pesos, 
then your growth rate has to be a nominal growth rate. So guess what's going to happen? If you picked a high inflation currency to do your valuation, you're doing it in nominal reais, your stable growth rate, the growth rate forever, can be 5 or 6%. Sounds like I'm giving you a free pass, right? But what offsets it? That high inflation, in addition to affecting your growth rate, will also push up your risk-free rate and your cost of capital. It's all going to be OK as long as you stay consistent. Now, notice the words that you cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. Can it be lower? So let's say your growth rate in the economy, nominal dollar terms, is 3%. Can it be 2%? Sure. In fact, most mature companies should grow at a rate less than the growth rate of the economy, right? Why? Because if they all grow at the growth rate of the economy, where do growth companies go then? If you have growth companies and mature companies in the same economy, for growth companies to have 20% growth rate, mature companies have to grow less than that 3%. So can it be 1%? Yeah. Can it be 0%? Can you put a growth rate of 0% forever? Sure. Can you put in a minus 5% a year forever? Absolutely. People never seem to use that option. The equation works fine. What are you telling me then about your company? It's going to peak in your tent, and then it's going to shrink and disappear. Yesterday, the session I did at Dartmouth is about corporate life cycles. And I was talking about it, and we talked about this in class. That the life cycle of a 20th century company was 80, 100, 125 years. Look at the GE, look at the Sears. It took 50 years for Ford to go from nothing to a, to a big company. It took them 30 years staying at the top, and then it took another 30 years for it to decline. It's still in that process. How long did it take Yahoo to go from startup to a $100 billion company? Six years. How long did they stay as a mature company? Five years till Google came along. How long did it take them to go away? Another 10 years. So in 23 years, you went from nothing to this big company. Do you see the concept? Today, if you ask me to value a tech company, maybe I shouldn't be using a 2% growth rate forever, which is what we've been trained to do. Because much of what we do in valuation comes from the 20th century. We were valuing companies like GE. But if you're valuing an Uber, the kind of technology we're talking about might be a technology that essentially comes with this timestamp which means I can give them 10 years of really high growth, growth I would never give a manufacturing company. I can let them grow with this incredible return on capital, returns on capital I would never give for a manufacturing company. But at the end of year 10, here's where I kind of compensate for all of that good stuff I gave you. I might put in a minus 5% growth rate. Doesn't mean your terminal value is going to be negative, it's going to be lower, and you essentially will shrink and go away. So your growth rate cannot exceed the growth rate of the economy. Whether it's a global or a domestic economy depends on the story you're telling about your company. If your company in your story stays domestic, then that cap is going to be the domestic growth rate. So that is one of the first challenges you face when you do DCF valuation, is when will my company be a mature company? Right? And as you think about this, you know, there are three choices here. Your company could already be a mature company. If you're valuing Toyota, how many years of high growth are left here? The answer is none. You already are a mature company. Might as well just value the company as a mature company. A third of all global companies, you don't have to play games with high growth periods and growth rates. These companies are effectively mature companies. It could be that your company has some high growth. If I get a chance, I'm going to pull up my Levi Strauss valuation. Levi Strauss is the second coming to markets. It's a public, uh, the IPO happened a few months ago. Second coming because they used to be a publicly traded company. They were taken private in a private equity deal, and now they've gone back public. They've been around a long time, but because of where they are in this business, they have a potential for growth, partly because they haven't had the kind of global growth, especially in Asia, that they could have had. Is that a pipe dream? Maybe. But I could tell a story about Levi Strauss, and I am, that I think they can grow at above the growth rate of the economy, but not for long. Why? Because this is a mature business. There's a lot of competition. So I'm going to give them a period of high growth and then very quickly bring them down to stable growth. And the third scenario is where you allow for high growth and then you have a transition phase. I haven't mentioned over what period. It could be over 10 years, over 20 years, over 25 years, but essentially, at the end of every single one of these, 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 these approaches, I end up with stable growth. 
saying, what if my company will never be a stable growth company? Don't ask me that question. Every company will eventually become a stable growth company. Math works its magic. You think, even Google? Yes. Because I've heard this said about companies repeatedly through time, that this company will never be a stable growth company. It's special. You know the company I first heard it about? In the early 1980s, I was told that about IBM. IBM was one of the great growth companies of the 20th century. It grew for 50 years at a rate far higher than the economy. So in 81, I was told, IBM will never be a mature company. By 88, IBM wished it were a mature company because its growth rate was negative. Then I was told Walmart will never become a mature company. 15 years later, and they, 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 they did do a good job of keeping growth going. They were a mature company. Then I was told Microsoft will never be a mature company. It became a mature company. Now it's had a second birth, right, with cloud. Every company eventually starts to run into brick walls. Apple is a mature company. I think you can value Apple as a mature company today. There is really no high growth left in the company. So when you think about doing this for your company, there are three things you're going to look at. One is you're going to look at the size of your company relative to the market that it serves. If you have a small company in a big market, you have much more freedom to allow it to grow at a high growth rate and get away with it. The reason I can put in an 8% growth rate for Levi Strauss and revenues is the apparel market is huge, and even if I give them 25% growth, their market share will barely hit 1%. This is a huge market. In contrast, if I take Toyota and give them a 10% growth rate, I'm very quickly going to have a problem. And here's what. It's already the largest automobile company in the world. So if I put in a 10% growth rate, either I have to list a bunch of losers here, or I'm going to run into a problem. In fact, there's a flip side to being a Tesla optimist. And this might be the better way for you to make money if you're a Tesla optimist, where you don't have to worry about an Elon Musk tweet storm blowing up your investment. So let's say you think Tesla can sell a million and a half cars. Somebody must, I mean, this is not a market where people are just going to buy a third car and a fourth car. They're buying this car instead of something else, right? So if you truly believe the Tesla thesis of a million and a half cars, how else would you make money? Sell short on Ford and Volkswagen and Chrysler because that, those cars have to come from somewhere. Or the autonomous car, if you're buying Tesla because, they, you know, in fact, that's the other tweet he sent out, right? A million autonomous cars, why do that? If you believe that, you should be selling short on Uber. You know why? Because Uber's entire story is built on, hey, we're going to be the autonomous car company. So you're going to look at the size of the company relative to the market. If you're a small company in a big market, you have much more leeway to grow. If you're a large company in a mature market, then things start to crimp up. Second, look at what they're growing at right now. If you give me, tell me your company is going to have 10 years of high growth, and I look at your last 10 years, and you've been growing at 1% a year. I'm not going to tell you it's impossible, but I'm going to tell you what's changed. And I look at revenue growth. I don't look at earnings growth, because revenue growth are where you're going to see the signs of slowing down. You can have pretty solid earnings growth, even as revenues, are, because you're cutting costs, you're doing other stuff. Look at revenue growth. And if that growth is starting to drop off, then build that into your growth goal. And finally, when we talked about growth, we talked a great deal about return on capital, whether you're earning a return on capital that is higher than your cost of capital. If you grow and you earn your cost of capital as you grow, you're creating no value. So this entire process becomes pointless if you have a company that basically runs in place, earns its cost of capital. So those are the three things that drive how long you allow growth to be. So I'm going to take my companies and give you the decisions I made about growth periods. And you might have made very different decisions. This is, these are my stories and my decisions, but you could have looked at the same companies, made different decisions. Let's start with Disney. As I sat there saying, should I allow high growth, should I treat them as a mature company? I'll give you the strikes against Disney when it comes to high growth. It's already a big entertainment company. And for it to grow, it's going to be tougher. So the size is going to work against them. They have some potential pluses. They have excess returns, right? They're earning well above the cost of capital. I can tell why they're earning excess returns. It's a brand name, the, the movie franchises, so clearly they have competitive advantages. And the entertainment space is shifting and morphing, and it's entirely possible that Disney can win at the expense of others. So I actually gave Disney 
a longer growth period of 10 years. But before you get too, you know, too, you know, if, if you feel that's too high, the growth rate I'm going to give them is not high. I'm just letting them grow it above the risk-free rate or above the growth rate of the economy. But I'm going to let it happen over 10 years. So basically five years of growth, and then I'm going to transition down. Then I took a look at Vale, largest iron ore mining company in the world. So the fact that it's a very large company works against it. And here the business is not going to grow. There's only so much iron ore on the ground. You can't become a 20% growth company because where is the iron ore going to come from? So I'm going to actually va value Vale as a mature company. I'm going to allow them to earn some comp you know, their competitive advantages. They have access to these reserves they've already bought. They can take advantage of those. They can make more than the cost of capital, but there's going to be no high growth that goes with it. I'm going to value them essentially as a mature company. For Tata Motors, I think the, the acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover gave them a second win. So in 2013, at least when I value them, I gave them a growth period, but I don't think it's going to come from mass market cars in India. It's going to come from either bringing luxury cars into India, Jaguar Land Rovers into India, or some other part of the world. So I'm going to give them a growth period of five years. And finally, for Baidu, which is a young tech company in a very big and growing market, I had a lot more leeway. I gave them a growth period of 10 years. I have never valued a company with a growth period longer than 10 years. And often the pushback you get is, aren't there companies that have grown for longer than 10 years? What's the answer to that? Absolutely. And we can name them. Companies that have had high growth for extended periods are the exceptions rather than the rule. It's true the Microsofts, the Walmarts, the Apples of the world have had growth longer than 10 years. But the very fact that we can name them tells you there are exceptions. And I don't want to value my company to be the exception, because then as an investor, what do I have to take away from this game? So as you look at these choices, look at all the things you learn about your company, make your best judgment, move on. Don't get stuck in any part of this process. It's not worth it. So I'm going to show you my valuation of Vale in November of 2013. I'll also have to tell you, I lost more money on this valuation than probably any other valuation I've done over the last decade. So I'll tell you what I got wrong. But I'll first show you what I did in the first place, and then I'll talk about what I got wrong. So this is November of 2013. I said, look, I'm going to you know, value Vale. So I sit there, and I, and at that time, iron ore prices had dropped. So I looked at the five years, and I said, you know, I, the return on capital goes up and down. But it goes primarily up and down because iron ore prices go up and down. And I'm going to normalize my returns looking across five years. So it's following the template, which is you have commodity companies, the earnings go up and down. You should normalize things. So I said the normalized return on capital is 17.25%. I estimate the cost of equity and capital doing all the levers we talked about, right? Risk-free rate in US dollars. Why? Because this is a dollar-based company. And equity risk premium that reflects where they do business. And guess what? Their biggest market is China, so I bring that in. And a beta that reflects the fact that they're in four different businesses. So essentially exactly the way we did you know, betas for. And I end up with an unlevered beta of 0.84 and a cost of equity of 10.87%. The cost of capital I end up with for the company, given those assumptions I made, is about 8.2%. That becomes my cost of capital forever. Remember, I'm valuing Vale as a, norm, as a mature company. And because I'm valuing them as a mature company, I have to normalize. Right? Because if I leave the numbers at last year's numbers, so if you take those numbers and feed them in, here's what I get. I get a cost of capital. Okay? 17626 is their operating income normalized. 20.92% is their effective tax rate over five years. To get their reinvestment, here's what I did. I assumed a growth rate forever of 2%. Why 2%? I'm doing my valuation in, in US dollar terms. 2% is about the inflation rate. I'm essentially letting them grow at the inflation rate of 2%. Their return on capital, if I normalize it, is 17.25%. So every year, to get that 2% growth, they will need to reinvest about 11.59%. So essentially, I'm letting the growth and the return on capital drive the reinvestment rate. As a general rule, those three numbers are locked at the head. You can make assumptions about two and estimate the third. Here, I'm using growth. And, re and return on capital to estimate my reinvestment rate. So I take my operating income, normalized, take out the taxes, take out the reinvestment. Because it is a mature company, I can divide by cost of capital minus the growth. 
the value that I get for the operating assets was about 203 billion. I add cash, I subtract our debt, I get a value for the equity, I divide by the number of shares, I get a value per share of $32, and the stock was trading at 13. And I bought it. And I wish I hadn't. Because in the next two years, it went to five. In fact, I wrote a post about, I, I, the title of my post was No Mas, No Mas. And I got all this pushback from the Portuguese saying, that's Spanish. You shouldn't be saying no. So they gave me the Portuguese. But I used to, there was this old fight, Roberto Duran fight from 20 years ago. In the middle of the fight, he throws up his hands and no mas, no mas, I'm done. I said, fine, I said, I'm done. And I went back and looked at what I screwed up on. And here were the three things I missed. One was that Vale was a Brazilian company, and Brazil can do some crazy things on you. So the two years after the valuation, the country went to hell in a handbasket, took my investment down with it. That's the first problem. The second is I made a fundamental mistake. I know prices were down when I did this valuation, and I assumed that the numbers already reflected the lower I know prices. So I know prices are down. You're reflecting earnings from last year. I'm assuming the numbers already reflect. What I missed was the fact that in commodity companies, it takes about two years before lower prices actually show up because they have forwards and futures. So I was actually two years ahead of the drop in earnings because the earnings continued to drop. So I've got the commodity price wrong. I got the country wrong. And then you had the Brazilian RIA take off you know, because it, and it was linked up to the fact that you'd, the country going to hell in a handbasket. All three Cs worked against me, commodity, country, currency. And the stock went to five, and I said, bye-bye. I did buy back Vale, thank God, because it kept dropping. It dropped to like two and a half, because I revalued it at five and ended up with like 550. And I said, you know what? It's, 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 no, it's, it. But it went, it went to two. It basically went to being undervalued again. So investments can kill you, but then you can't avoid them for the rest of your life. But this is... Uh, I'm valuing it as a mature company and built into this valuation are assumptions, implicit assumptions, that if they change, your value can change as well. Yes? Yeah. Don't really get into this. You took a normalized return. Normalized operating income, normalized return on capital. Valued it at steady state, 50% yeah. growth. And then you took the cost of capital and... No, that's a steady state. Yeah. So, so, that's a that's a present that's the present value of a perpetuity, right? That's yeah, what you yeah. usually find in the terminal value equation. Yeah, get the uh, equation. Yeah. So you do the, the top line, the value of the operating income. So start with the operating income, right? Net out the taxes, so as we after tax. Net out the reinvestment, so the net that's what you'd see net capex. So reinvestment is net capex and change in working capital. So what I have in the numerator now is free cash flow to the firm, right? Free cash flow to the firm divided by cost of capital minus growth rate gives me the value of the operating assets. So that equation is what you normally see in your terminal year. I'm applying it right away because if you're in steady state already, I don't have to wait till year 10 to do this. I can do this today. Okay. So all you're doing is using the same equation you'd use any time you have perpetual growth. You're applying it on today's numbers. But I have to normalize if I do this because the commodity company and I use last year's numbers, then my, the, and I assume that that's forever, I'm essentially either using too high or too low a number. But implicit there is the assumption that iron ore prices will normalize, and that's another assumption that can get me into trouble. Right. And yeah. So in this valuation that you actually spent money on, you did not do anything to normalize commodity prices? Or like I did. The way I come up and normalize it is I assume that the normalized price is an average across five years. And that, I think, was a fatal mistake. Because if you look at iron ore prices over history, the last 120 years, between 2002 and 2012, you look at that graph, it's like you know, $40 a ton. And then you get to 2002, it jumps to like $100 for the next 10 years. And what caused that? China. So all that infrastructure in China, essentially, and it's not just iron ore. Across, you look at commodity after commodity, that 2002 to 2012 is almost like a break in history. And maybe when I normalize, what should I have done then? It's gone back a much longer time period. I did not have the foresight to do it. So that, I think, is one of the reasons the valuation is so high, is because when I normalize, I'd look at a five-year history, but that five-year history was all good years, basically. I wasn't going back long enough. But implicit in any kind of normalization is an assumption you're making 
about what the future will look like. And here, that assumption clearly got me into trouble. Yeah. You had mentioned that between a bank and right. situation where you need to go from A to B, besides the equity, you need to bring in how else do you keep that? You probably have to affect your costs because a lot of uh, Vale's costs are still in Brazil. In a strange way, when the REI got weaker, they, they actually got stronger because their margins became much better. Yeah. You'd have to probably reflect on the margins. You probably also reflect the fact, especially in a company like Vale, which is a political company, right? Who, remember the, when we did the corporate governance in Vale, who owns the golden shares? The Brazilian government does. So the Brazilian gov this is a company where you're linked at the hip, whether you like it or not, to the, to the government. So the Vale and a Petrobras, the government is always inside the door. Forget about being outside the door. So, this becomes a very real problem for you because any problems in Brasilia then feed into problems for you at the corporate governance level. So it means your margins will probably have to be adjusted. Your cost of equity and capital will probably have to be higher. But I still would have the iron ore price problem, which is that's a problem that would have been there. And so I think I'd have lost money no matter what, to be quite honest. I can't blame Brazil and I can't blame the currency. I got the commodity price wrong. And in hindsight, all you can do is learn from it. So now when I value commodity companies, I actually do a very, you know, if you come back to my valuation class, we'll go through the process. I no longer do this normalization because I learned from Vale how much trouble it can get me into by taking the history over time. So let's talk about the terminal value for Disney. For Disney, I have to wait till year 10 because I have high growth. And when I get to my terminal value, here are some of the things I'm going to try to do to keep my terminal value from running away from me. First, I'm going to make sure I respect the cap. Remember the cap I said cannot be greater than the growth rate of the economy? And I might have done this in earlier iterations when we talked about implied premiums. I actually use my risk-free rate as my proxy for the growth rate in the economy. The risk-free rate has an expected inflation and an expected real interest rate built into it, right? The growth rate in the economy has the same expected inflation and an expected real growth rate. So to me, going above the risk-free rate is always dangerous. So I cap the growth rate at the risk-free rate, which means I cannot grow faster than 2.5%. I actually, I'm sorry, 2.75%, which is the T-bond rate then. I actually let Disney grow at slightly below the 2.75%, at 2.5%. So that's the first stop. Second, when you get to be a mature company, you've got to revisit this question of, am I earning more than my cost of capital? Right? For the next 10 years, I can tell you all kinds of stories about earning more than the cost of capital. You have a patent, you have license, you have protection. But you're now at 10, you're 10. Now I've got to revisit that question. And most of the time when I revisit that question, my conclusion is there's nothing in this business that's going to allow you to earn excess returns forever. And if you make that judgment, your return on capital then will become equal to your cost of capital in your time. If you work for McKinsey, this is the default. What do you say here? You work for McKinsey? OK, you're good. Okay. You work for McKinsey, this is the default. Uh, this is actually required. In McKinsey, every valuation, when you get to stable growth, your excess returns are assumed to go to zero. And their argument is a very reasonable one. No company may, can make more than its cost of cap forever, so we're going to bring the return on capital down to the cost of capital. And the only pushback I would have against that is, that's true forever. But I'm at your 10. If I take a company like Disney, do you think Mickey is going to disappear as a brand name in year 11? I don't think so. I think there are going to be still residual benefits left over, perhaps not as big as they were in year one. So I'm going to bring the return on capital down, but I'm not going to bring it all the way down to my cost of capital. I'm going to bring it down to 10%, which will still allow them to earn a healthy excess return. It's my way of differentiating companies with really long-term sustainable advantages from companies that don't have that advantage. You're going to see me do the same thing with Levi Strauss. Leave the return on capital above the cost of capital. What is Levi Strauss's biggest competitive advantage? It's brand name, right? And basically, that brand name has been around a long time. It's been mismanaged for a long period. But the reality is, that is an enduring brand name. And that brand name will, my, will, will allow them to earn. How much more is, a, is up for debate? But in this case, I brought the return on capital down to 10%. You're saying, why do I need a return on capital? Remember, I'm assuming a 2.5% growth rate forever? 
to generate that 2.5% growth rate with a 10% return on capital, I will need to reinvest 25% of my after-tax operating income back into the company. It's a two and a, so everything is linked together because once I make that growth assumption in return on capital, my reinvestment has to fall out of it. Finally, one final loose end. When I make my company a mature company and I bring its growth rate down, it's not as big an issue for Disney because it's already a pretty low growth company, but let's say you're valuing NVIDIA. You give them a 25% growth rate. Why? Because they make the fastest processes in the face of the earth and you think there's going to be a whole lot of Bitcoin mining going on. I mean, let's face it, NVIDIA, one of the big reasons they've grown is, is the crypto boom has pushed them up. You put, give them a 25% growth rate and you give them a high cost of capital. So far, so good, right? High growth, high risk. At the end of year 10, you make NVIDIA into a mature company. You give them a 3% growth rate. Their cost of capital should now reflect that of a mature company. In this case for Disney, I bring the cost of capital down to what I think a mature Disney's cost of capital would look like by adjusting my debt ratio to what I think is a long-term sustainable debt ratio. Right now, they're at 12. I don't think they'll go to my optimal of 40. I split the difference and gave them a 20% debt ratio, cost of capital of 7.29%. Those are the four things I routinely do in my terminal value calculation to make sure I've not lost control. First, I check the growth rate. Make sure it's less than the risk-free rate because, as I said, that's a good proxy. Second, check, in, check for the assumption you make about return on capital. Third, make sure you then reinvest enough to get the growth rate. And finally, check your cost of capital. If you have a 15% cost of capital now, don't leave it at 15% forever once you make it a mature company. And if you follow those four simple rules, your terminal value will stay under your control rather than the other way around. So you got cash flows, you got discount rates, you got growth rates, you got a terminal value, take the present value. You heave a sigh of relief, you think you're done, but you're not quite. So let's tie up some loose ends. If you do a dividend discount model, you are truly done because you discount dividends back at the cost of equity. What you get as the present value is the value of equity today. You can walk away. If you take free cash flows to equity and discount them at the cost of equity, you value all of the equity in the company. The one loose end you might have to worry about is if you've granted equity options to your managers, that's a drain on you. So you might have to subtract out the options you've given away to management because they don't belong to you. But if you take free cash flows to the firm and discount them at the cost of capital, there's a whole host of loose ends you got to tie up. So let's say I do this for Apple. I take my cash flows, I discount the cost of capital, I come up with the present value. I value the operating assets, right? You know what I haven't valued? Any asset whose income is, part of my op whose income is not part of my operating income, <laughs> I haven't valued yet. In the case of Apple, there's one very big item that I haven't valued, right? Which is the $250 billion in cash. Why? Because the income from cash is not part of operating income. I've got to add the cash on. You know what else I need to add on? To the extent that I've crossed holdings in other companies, 3%, 5%, 7% of another company, I need to value those cross holdings and bring them in because I haven't valued them in. The income from cross holdings doesn't show up as part of my operating income. With the Asian and Latin American companies, your work has just begun when you think it's done. Because you discount the cash flows, you get to a cost of capital, and then you start to mop, tie up these loose ends. You realize how many loose ends there are. Don't double count. Don't, don't even look at the balance sheet. You're going to be tempted to add things you should not be adding because you'll have items like goodwill and intangibles. You feel the, don't do that. That's already embedded. When we talk about things you haven't counted, we're actually think, talking about things that can never show up as part of your operating income. I get to value the firm. I subtract out the debt. I get the value of equity. And as I said, if you have no options outstanding, then you can just divide by the number of shares. Just make sure you count all the shares. What I mean by that is companies play these crazy games on share count. They have a primary share count, and they have restricted shares that they don't count for some reason. Restricted shares are shares they give their employees. They're all shares. You, know, you have to count them all. But if you have given options, you've got to value those options because that's another claim on your equity. Subtract it out, divide by the number of shares. You get a value per share. Yes? Yeah, I think in a sense, uh, it, I'll tell you something, it makes so little difference in your valuation whether you leave it at 1 or 1.1, that I'd rather spend my energy on getting that excess return. So time is 
time is scarce, so you've got to decide where you want to spend your time. I could finesse the cost of capital. I could probably come up with a better estimate of a mature entertainment company's cost of capital. It might be 7.4% instead of 7.2%. It's just not worth the effort. In general, cost of capital beyond about 30 minutes of work is not worth the effort. You might as well move on, because you have so much work to do on your numerator, you might as well spend it there. Right? Yes? Got to count them all. Everything, Everything should, should be counted. Non-voting non shares, voting shares, <laughs> uh, vested shares, non-vested shares. Exactly. 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 Take a look at Uber's balance. You'll see very quickly. I had a really tough time figuring out how many shares they had outstanding. It's, and I'm not even still clear. I don't believe. Uh, so you look at the Yahoo Finance. It'll give you a share count. I don't, for the moment, believe that they've got it right. I mean, because there are layers of restricted shares and options. Because when they bought Kareem, they granted restricted shares. They have all these options they've granted venture capitalists. There's so all kinds of crap overhanging me that I don't even know about. But as an equity investor, it's my job to do due diligence and come up with that share count. And for some companies, it's going to be incredibly messy even coming up with that number. Yeah. Uber for voting rights and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, ex and, and, and you're, so let's say you're voting and non-voting shares, which is what a lot of these companies have. I will treat them as one, but I do know that the shares I'm buying are probably going to be which kind of shares? The non-voting shares. I should be buying them at a discount on the voting shares, but if I want to do that, then I've got to take an extra step. And for the moment, I don't want to go there, but in the valuation class, we talk about how to estimate a premium for, because you, you know, I would rather have the shares with the voting rights than without the voting rights. So, but for the moment, do at least an a value per share. The difference between the voting and the non-voting shares may be 5, 6, 10%. And if you want to put, set it up as an algebra problem where the voting shares are worth 10% more than the non-voting shares, you can estimate a value per share based on that judgment. Yeah. Do you think the sources have different share counts? Go, go to the source. Yeah. Go to the source. Go back to the 10K. And don't expect it to be given in any meaningful direct way. Eh? It'll be footnotes to footnotes to footnotes, and you got to start. I mean, to me, this is the most painful part of valuation, is actually getting the share count done. Is there are so many different places they throw things in that you might want to have to, you, you have to double check and triple check before you get that final share count. And don't believe an analyst when he says per share numbers. The per share numbers are completely meaningless because you got the share count wrong. How do I, market cap for these companies is in a sense fiction. <coughs> Because how do you get market cap? You take the price per share and multiply by share count. If you've got the share count round, I actually saw for Lyft, Google Finance reported a market cap of 20 billion, and Yahoo Finance reported a market cap of 70 billion on the same day with the same stock price. What does that tell you? They've got different share counts. They probably both screwed it up, which means if I want a market cap for Lyft, I actually have to go in and figure out what the share count is. So I always go back to the source. So we did Vale, let's move on to valuing Deutsche. First, I'm going to value Deutsche in 2008. In early 2008, remember I took the trusting route. The trusting route in what sense? I trusted that Deutsche was run by sensible people and that they were paying out what they could afford to in dividends. And therefore, I could discount the dividends and come up with the value of the equity. So let's start by with the dividend discount model valuation of Deutsche. At that time, their, net in their, their income on average over the previous five years was about 3,954 million. Their dividends were about 2,146 million, so they paid out about 54% of their net income. So I was trying a little bit at least to be conservative because 2018 numbers were so, I'm sorry, 2008 numbers were so high, I said, I've got to normalize. So you know, the way I normalized was I looked an average across time. Their payout ratio was about 54%. If you take that 54% as their expected payout ratio for the next five years, and that's an assumption. They re reinvest about, the retention ratio is about 46%. Their normalized return on equity was about 11.8%. Their actual return was actually 16 or 17%. I replaced that with the normalized number. The growth rate I got was 5.4%. You project out the net income at that 5.4% growth rate. You keep the payout ratio fixed. You get the expected dividends for the next five years. So very simple, income times payout ratio. Question. I'm, so normalize is actually a fancy word for what am I doing? I'm just taking an average over the last five years. And this is usually what normalization means. And you see how much trouble it got me 
into with the Vale process, right? So when we normalize, people, you think there's somebody sitting there finessing the numbers. No, they're just taking an average over time. And this is about as bludgeon an approach as you can take. And it's going to get me in trouble with Deutsche Bank as well. So maybe the lesson I'm trying to convey is learn from my mistakes here. Don't normalize by averaging across five years. But you're going to very quickly see that you know, when you think about normalizing, this is something that there is no one template I can give you. It depends on the company. So I get expected dividends for the next five years. I discount them back at my cost of equity because dividends are cash flows to equity. I get a present value of the dividends for the next five years. Yes? The 11% is actually my return on equity because remember, retention ratio times return on equity is my expected growth rate. So I get a present. Am I done? So that gives me the present value of dividends for the next five years. What happens after year five? Five years is usually long enough to get cycles in, in, in if you look at you know, cycles in sectors. And I think if you're looking at commodity price cycles, you can argue 25, 30 years. There's a problem. There's a trade-off here, right? Which is if I go back longer, I get a longer time period. But Deutsche as a, as a bank actually it changed over that. So the further back you go, the further you have a problem at scaling. Okay? So that's why there is no historical period which I can say is optimal. Because holding all else constant, I'd go back 50 years. Deutsche, I can go back 50 years, but I'll get a German bank for the first 25 years, a pure bank. Then I get this 15-year period where they did strange things jumping all over. So the problem here with, normal, with looking at history in general is no matter what time period you pick, it's not going to give you a clean look. You're not going to capture macro cycles here just by going back longer periods. Which basically means that perhaps if we want to think about normalizing for macro, you can't get it from history anymore. That there's no mean reversion in this process that you can kick into, which makes this a much more difficult exercise. So when you sit down to value a company today, will there be a recession in the future? Let's start with the easy question. Yes. Do we know when it'll be? I don't think so. So I'm not going to build in a recession, but I've got to build in the potential for recession and the way I would do that is through margins and returns and capital over time. Over time, that's where you're going to see the convergence. Because even if I bought in you know, recessions and recoveries into my, it's not going to change my overall valuation that much. So the question of whether you're at the peak of a cycle, the middle of a cycle, or a bottom of a cycle is a judgment call. I mean, I've been told we're at the peak of the cycle. You know how long? Six years now, people have been telling you it's the peak of the cycle. And the problem with trying to then bring in a macro view of this is the peak, we're going to get the downturn soon, is then you're building into your valuations a macro view. It's not normalization. You're just bringing in a macro view. So it's actually a very fine line between trying to accept the fact that there'll be macro ups and downs and not trying to play God on the macro level. Okay, so I try not, because I'm terrible at macro forecasting. If you're good at macro forecasting, I think you should try to bring it into your numbers. But I know my history. I know that whenever I try to do a macro forecast, it breaks. You know, my valuations start to break down. Yes. So then, in that case, going back to Bali, why wouldn't you consider averaging to divide by the price of oil over time? Oh, you mean iron ore? Yeah. You could. In fact, that's what I increasingly do with my commodity companies. Is I no longer try to even normalize. I basically take the price of iron ore as my big unknown because that's what it is, right? And I build my valuation around it, but I don't want to bring a point of view about iron ore prices into my valuation. What I do then is do, remember how we did Monte Carlo simulations? I do the simulation around that. Because at least I want to be aware of how wrong I could be if iron ore prices shift. And that's something that, came, so out of the Vale valuation, that's one of the things that's happened is I no longer with commodity companies even try to normalize. I don't know what a normal oil price is. And you know what? I'm not alone. Oil companies have given up on what a normal oil price is. So increasingly, as you give up on the notion of normal, both on the commodity level and the macro level, we have to think of other tools to bring in that concern. Because that concern is always there. You've got to think about how much you know, buffer does my company have to survive a downturn. And perhaps a better way to do that is through Monte Carlo simulations and other ways of dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's not even sensitized and being aware of the fact that every time iron ore prices move I'm going to notice on this company but because I'm incapable of forecasting iron ore companies I am buying Vale because it's cheap given where iron ore prices are today so if iron ore prices go up I'll get a double whammy I'll get the increase in value from the iron ore prices going up plus I'll get the increase in value because Vale was undervalued to begin with right I don't want to buy commodity companies because I think the commodity price will go up you know why there's an easier way for you to make money. If you think commodity prices are going to go, just go buy the futures. If you have that strong a view on commodity prices, don't even play the game of going through the company. It's just too much work. If you're valuing companies, you want to be as macro neutral as you can be. Okay? And that's why I don't take a point of view. Are we at the peak of a cycle? Because when I do that, I am taking a point of view about the macro end. And if I were that good at making macro calls, my investments would be at the asset allocation level because then you'd move my money between equities and bonds, not between Disney and Vale. So you've got to make a judgment on what you're going to bring to the table in investing. Are you going to play the macro game? Are you going to play the micro game? I'm not good at the macro game, so I play the micro game, which means I'm going to get hammered by big macro shocks. I did not see the 2008 crisis coming. I never did. I, was, I won't even claim I, I saw a glimmer of it. It, was, it came one day. And when it came, I got my portfolio got hammered. But I can't draw the wrong lessons from that. If the lesson I draw from that is I want to predict the next crisis, you, you have the debris that, that people have in their portfolios now because of doing that, right? There have been people who have been out of stocks for the last 10 years. Why? Because they're trying to ne avoid the next big crisis. Even if they avoid the next big crisis, guess what? They're going to be worse off than somebody who lived through this process saying, there was a crisis, I lost, now I've got to restart again. So macro is always a dangerous place to go for me. And I don't go there. Now, the case of Deutsche, what's left? After the five years, what happens? The company becomes a mature company. It starts growing at 3% a year. So I've got to start making it a mature company. Here's where I'm going to start. With a 3% growth rate, I've got to figure out how much they can afford to pay in dividends after year five. It won't be the same number they paid for the first five years. And to estimate what their payout ratio is going to be, I take the growth rate of 3%. I have to make an assumption about what, remember for Disney, I assume return on capital would be higher than the cost of capital. Banking, I think, is more of a zero excess return. It's going to increasingly become, and this was pre-2008. My view was increasingly it's going to become a zero excess return game. So I set the return on equity equal to the cost of equity. And if my return on equity is 8.5%, to get a growth rate of 3%, I can pay out 65% of my earnings as dividends. Again, I'm trying as, as much as I can to be consistent. Once I make the company a lower growth company, I've got to make it pay out dividends like a mature company. It pays out 64%. And now I have to, to bring it all together. In year, year six, because to get my value in year five, remember I need dividends in year six, I take the net income in year six. So that's the net income in year five, growing out 3%. I multiply that net income by 64.7%. That's a payout ratio. I get expected dividends in year six. You divide the expected dividends by cost of equity minus the growth rate. I get a terminal value for my stock. What's left to do? That's what my equity will be worth at the end of year five. I need to bring it back to today, right? Now this is something mechanically that people sometimes have issues with. When I bring it back to today, that's 62318, I'm going to use the cost of equity for the first five years because I've got to live through the first five years to get there. So I estimate the terminal value using the new cost of equity, but I bring it back using that original cost of equity. What I get as a present value is 40079 You add that on to the number of shares outstanding, I'm sorry, the value of dividends over the first five years, you get an overall value of equity divided by the number of shares. You get 105. And this is a stock where the crisis really decimated the company. I mean, you know what Deutsche is trading at right now, right? It's trading at about $10 to $11 per share. The devastation in the stock has been truly gruesome to watch. And in fact, in October of 2016, they had one of their periodic calamities. For the last 10 years, every two years, Deutsche has a calamity. A catastrophe is more like it. In fact, the title for, this, uh, for, for the post I did on this was A Greek Tragedy at a German Company. What's a German word? Schadenfreude? Is it a, I mean, because the, the Germans like to talk about how irresponsible the Greeks are. 
This is something you'd expect at a Greek bank. And the Germans would say, I told you so. Greeks should never be allowed to run banks. Hey, this is, your, this is Deutsche Bank, the ultimate German institution. And if you talk about Greek banking being shoddy, this is about as shoddy as a bank can get. Right? So here, when, you, when I valued Deutsche, I actually had to value it from a position of weakness. First, it was losing money, losing lots of money. And I've been losing money for eight years. And it had a $15 billion fine from the, from the Justice Department on it. So basically, everything was bad. I had to dig it out of the hole. And I really tried. I basically brought their return in equity from a negative number to a positive number, not to something high. I basically assumed that over time, they would find a way to at least earn their cost of equity. So you see the return in equity go from minus 13.7% to, to plus 9.44%, which is the cost, cost of equity in your tent. As the return in equity improves, my net loss becomes a net profit. But because they're in a regulatory capital hole, I had to dig them out of the hole. And thank God I'm no longer using the dividend discount model, right? Because the dividend discount model, the worst I can do is put zero. This company is worse than zero because it's going to cause delusion. I'm going to have to issue equity. By having free cash flow equity, I capture that. I have negative cash flows for the next three years. Eventually, the cash flows turn. And you take the present value of those free cash flows equity, again, at a cost of equity. But here, the cost of equity changes over time. It starts off at a 10.2% cost of equity, which is a, what I would give a risky bank, the 75th percentile. And over time, I assume it'll converge on the cost of equity of a median bank. So here, there are a lot more moving pieces because I'm trying to take a bank in deep trouble and fix it on my spreadsheet. With those fixes in, the value that I get for the equity per share is $23. But there is a very real chance that one big shock, one more big shock could put the bank under. Banks don't go bankrupt. There's too much social cost, especially a bank the size of Deutsche. <laughs> what will go into is the equivalent of receivership, where a government takes over and the bank continues to run. But if that happens, your equity is worth nothing. It's wiped out. So I've assumed a 10% chance that that could happen. And if you bring that in, the value per share you get is 26 to 7. So you can see how as banks get into more trouble, the dividend discount model is going to become a worse and worse tool. In fact, it's going to become completely ineffective at some point. And you have to have this other tool in your hand. For Tata Motors to do their free cash flow equity valuation, again, I gave them five years of growth. Right? And here the growth rate was based upon those returns in equity. They, they had this you know, high return equity, basically from the Jaguar Land Rover part. And with those free cash flows equity, the present value that I get using the cost of equity with that high growth period is 127 billion rupees. But to this again, I get a terminal value. And by now you can see what I do. I first bring the cost of equity down to that of a mature company. I give them an equity reinvestment rate based on their growth rate and return in equity forever. So here again, as with the uh, Deutsche, I'm assuming that in steady state, they will earn their cost of equity. And I take the present value. The value per share that I get is the present value of the cash flows to equity, including the terminal value over time. So the template here is, is, is a fairly simple one. You make a judgment about what you think your growth period is going to be. You do dances around that growth period to get cash flows during that period. Then at the end of the period, you say, my company is going to be a mature company. But then you give it all the characteristics of a mature company, the growth rate of a mature company, the excess returns of a mature company the reinvestment of a mature company, the cost of capital for a mature company, and then you take the present value to today, you get the value of the firm. This is my Baidu valuation in November 2013. And here I had to dance at complex dance. If you remember, I projected revenue growth first, and then the margins would change over time. And so essentially, when you look at my, my revenue growth, 25% for the next five years, scaling down. This is the most general way to do valuation, because instead of focusing on return on capital or return on equity, I'm starting with revenues, projecting out operating income every year, using that operating income to come up with after-tax operating income, then figuring out how much to reinvest to get the revenue growth, because ultimately revenue growth is what's driving my reinvestment. And over time, my free cash flows get more and more positive, partly because I'm reinvesting less and less. So it's an extension of what we did in the previous three valuations, but now I'm starting with the revenues and working down. In fact, the spreadsheet I sent you, the simple Ginzu, is built around those three numbers. 
revenue growth, margin, sales recap. Revenue growth is your growth part of your story. Margin is what you think will happen to your margins over time. And sales to capital tells me how efficiently you think your company will reinvest money. You bring those three things together, you got your free cash flows. And at some point in time in the future, you still have to make that judgment of my company will be a mature. So that doesn't go away. It just got to, you're getting there with a different pathway by starting with revenues and working down. So let's value Disney. Right? Talked about Disney all semester. Yes? There's no corporate governance risk that's built in here, right? Because in a sense, that's a good point, which is even if you believe the value of equity is whatever it is, the question you're asking is, do I really have a claim against that equity? And that's actually an open question you could ask about Baidu, about Alibaba, about any of these companies, is should I even think of myself as a shareholder in the company? Because you don't technically own shares. And that's a scary thought. That might be something that holds you back. See, there, you have to make a judgment on whether you want to bring it into the valuation or whether you want to make that part of your decision process. Because let's say you find it to be undervalued. You might still not pull the trigger saying, it is undervalued if I actually had a share, but I don't think I have a share. So some things you might want to defer to that decision part of the process because that decision part is still yours. You're not automatically buying things that look undervalued. For Disney, I gave them five years of high growth where I assumed the status quo. You know what I mean by the status quo? I assume that Bob Iger would continue to run the company, would continue to do the things he's done historically. Like what? Reinvest like he's done in the past. Earn returns on capital like he's done in the past. Stay with the debt ratio that he chose because it's not, they look like they're pretty comfortable with it. So for the next five years, you'll notice ever, you know, the cost of capital stays at where it is today. The return on capital and reinvestment rate is what they've earned historically. So for the next five years, I let them continue to be the kind of company they are today. At the end of year five, I'm at year six. Rather than try to deal with that, I basically went to my terminal year, which is year 11. I made them a mature company. And you saw that what I gave them as a mature company. I gave them a 2.5% growth rate. I brought their returns and capital down, but not all the way down to my cost of capital. And I gave them the cost of capital of a mature company. So for the next five years, it's status quo. In year 11, they're a mature company. You're saying, what about year six through 10? I'm always looking for ways to make my life easier in valuation. The last thing I want to be doing is doing year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10 individually because it'll drive me crazy. So let me give you the numbers and you can probably guess what I did. What's my growth rate for the next five years? It's going to be 6.8%, right? What's my growth rate after year five, uh, after year 10? It's two and a half percent. So what do you think I used as my growth rate in year six? I took the difference between 6.8 and 2.5, and I divided by 5, and I took linear steps down. You think that is so unsophisticated. Hey, if you want to be fancy and build a log normal, an exponential function to get that from, be my guess. It's not going to make a change in my value that much. I want to get my cash flows, and I use 6 through 10 purely as a transition phase. So my cost of capital, 7.81% for the next five years, goes in step functions down to 7 so if you look at your 6 through 10, you will see no inputs from me. It'll basically be numbers to get me from where I am today to where I want to be. So those numbers pulled together, at least in November of 2013. Here's what I get. So as I go through these, this is kind of a review of the entire class because every number on this page comes from something we did two sessions ago, eight sessions ago, 10 sessions. So let's start at the bottom. Risk free rate of 2.75%. Do you know where that came from? The T-bond rate in November of 2013. Why am I using that? Because I'm doing my valuation. I chose to do my valuation in US dollars. Remember, currency is a choice. The beta 1.0013. That's my bottom-up beta from building the five businesses. Go back and look at packet one, slide, whatever, 135. No, I built the business, 1.9239. Their current debt to equity ratio, where I converted leases to debt, is 13%. There's my levered beta. Equity risk premium of 5.76%. That came from where they do business 82% in the US, 18% in the rest of the world. It's a weighted average. My cost of equity of 8.52% came from that. The cost of debt, the 1% spread comes from their actual rating, which is single leg. So I just took the default spread. The marginal tax rate for Disney was 36%. So that's my after tax cost of debt. The weights are current market value weights. 
The equity, of course, is just a share price times number of shares. In the debt, though, is the market value of interest-bearing debt plus the present value of lease commitments. So it's essentially everything we defined as debt. Cost of capital of 7.81%. So this part, we spent the first, that was the first half of the class, coming up with that cost of capital. Then we talked about, does Disney take good projects? And we captured that with the return on capital, where we divided after-tax operating and combined invested capital, 12.61%. The reinvestment rate we brought in a couple of sessions ago, it's what they're putting back into the business. That growth rate comes from the kinds of, when you build valuations, you want to build them to be def defensible. So let's say you're presenting this to a Disney management team and they're disappointed with the low value. What, do, what will they want you to do? So why don't you use a higher growth rate? And what should your response be? I'm willing to, but tell me what's going to change. Because how do you get a higher growth rate? Either you've got to increase your return on capital on new projects, so tell me what you're doing that does that, or you're going to reinvest more. But I can't just magically just push your growth rate to 9%. I want a lower cost of capital. Okay, I can tell you what you need to do. You need to use a different mix of debt and equity and perhaps use different debt. Every number year has to go back to its roots. It's not just a number you can change. But with those, that growth rate, and this cost, if I discount the cash flows, the value that I get for the operating assets is about $125 billion. I add cash, and then I add non-operating investments. You know what that non-operating investment was? Disney actually does not consolidate their Hong Kong theme park because they don't own 51%. Part of the requirement, and this is, I think, true for Shanghai as well, is part of the requirement for investing, Disney investing in China is the Chinese government gets a majority ownership, which means that because you own less than 50%, you don't have to consolidate. So I actually had to bring in their Hong Kong theme park as a separate value because I hadn't counted it as part of my operating income. So that's in that 2.8 billion. I subtract out minority interest. That reflects the fact that they have a majority stake in some company and this minority interest is what doesn't belong to them. And that, I get a value for the equity of 114 billion. Disney does have some options left over from, an old, from a past age. Most companies in the US have increasingly shifted away from options to restricted stocks. And I thank God for that. It makes it much easier for me in valuation if you have restricted stock. But those options that are left over have a value of about 972 million. I subtract them out, and I divide by the number of shares. Value per share you get is 63. Today, we're valuing Disney. You know what the big X factor has become? First, you've got to bring in the Fox acquisition, which is a big, messy thing that's still not played out in the numbers. And the second, of course, is Disney's big plans in streaming. All we know right now is it's going to cost a ton of money it's going to be a negative cash flow business. It's going to drain cash. But potentially, it could change Disney as a company because it will bring Disney into a subscription model, right? A subscription model that could have a deal. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. So I took that valuation that you just saw on the previous page, and I decided to frame it differently. Remember at the start of this class, I said there were three big decisions every company has to make. The investment decision, the financing decision, the dividend decision. And we spent the first 13 weeks of this class talking about the investment decision. Everything we talked about. So in fact, I could t start this class with this. Don't worry, I'm not planning to do this. With this slide and work backwards, because it frames everything we did in the class. Why do we talk so much about the investment decision? Because the investment decision affects your return on capital and your reinvestment rate, and through that, the growth rate. Why do we spend time on the financing decision? Because the financing decision affects the cost of capital, and through the cost of capital, it affects value. Why do we spend so much time on the dividend decision? Because the dividend decision affects the reinvestment rate, and through the reinvestment rate, it affects growth and value. Everything in corporate finance has a place in valuation. So when we talk about taking better projects, I'm thinking through, what does it mean to, for return on capital and growth rate and value going forward? So ultimately, the value of a company comes from basic corporate finance decisions. And if you want to change the value of a company, then what do you have to do? Something's got to change, right? You either have to generate more cash flows or have a lower cost of capital or have a higher growth rate. So I will make that part of the, the closing presentation, but we'll talk, but the levers are all there. We know what we need to do to change the value of a company. It's not going to be easy necessarily, but everything that affects the value of a company is somewhere in this process. 
So I'll stop there and um, I hope to see those Excel summary sheets by midnight. If you get out done earlier, don't feel the urge to wait till midnight. <laughs> eh? So send it whenever you get done. And um, try to keep, keep to the template. That's the thing about steady growth is changing the return of capital. Well, I, mean, I mean, when you like not evaluate, not um, 
have to yeah. yeah. put it yeah. in the You input to the multiplication. Yeah. yeah. What happens if I use and one of the Oh your next year's numbers as your multiplication? No. If I use one of the so if I'm doing for example um, 2010 to 2018, I used one as 2010, and then. Oh, you do the reverse, so basically yeah. you could always go back. Nothing. Nothing will happen. Just make sure you stay like yeah, 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 all the way through, because like, otherwise I'll get confused. Okay. The only thing is when you do the returns, right now the lookup of the returns is also most.